dear students welcome to my class myself dimple vargis and i teach biology i am very much excited today and i know the same is on the other side as well you two are feeling very much excited why because we are meeting for the first time but that to virtually so before i begin with the class i wish you all the best and i wish and pray that your association with placid bring out the best in you okay children so today in the beginning i'm taking this chapter chapter 8 from your biology textbook and the name of the chapter is cell the unit of life i hope you understood why i took this chapter initially or at first because you have been learning about cell uh, over the years now you know a lot of lot about cell so i thought this chapter is going to be bit easy and simple for you to learn to begin so let us begin with the class okay so let us first understand what are the contents of this topic what all things are we going to study in this chapter we are going to talk about what is cell then unicellular and multicellular organisms discovery of cell then we talk about cell theory then an overview of cell and then in detail we talk about the structure of the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell okay so let us begin the topic by answering to the question given on the slide what is it that makes an organism living or what is it that an inanimate thing does not have which a living thing has i know you already know the answer and the answer is cell yes all the living organisms are made up of cells that is common to all living organisms and this is what uh, it makes it different from the non living things so this is what is the answer i think you already answer what is the living things having in them okay moving on let us define what is a cell cell is a structural and functional unit of life now what do you mean by structural and functional unit of life structural unit of life means we know all living organisms are made up of cells that is, all the living organisms their building block or what they are made up of is the cell and all the functions that an organism carries out is actually happening within its constituent cell so that is what is meant by cell is a structural and functional unit of living organisms now i know that you may be knowing this the term cell was derived from the latin term cella which means small room and the study of cells is called as cell biology cellular biology or cytology an organism consists of one or more cells and accordingly they are classified as unicellular or multicellular so an organisms organism may have one or more cells so if they have only one cell in them if the body comprises of only one cell they are referred to as unicellular and if they made up of many cells we are referring them to as multi cellular or let us go back to this uh, arch whitaker's classification arch whitaker's classification where you know that the living world has been classified into five kingdoms which are they they are monera then comes protista then fungi plantae and animalia okay so this is the uh, living world being classified by arch whitaker into five groups or five kingdoms now if we talk about unicellular multicellular organisms where will you find unicellular organisms you will be finding unicellular organisms especially in the kingdom monera and the most common member in the kingdom monera is bacteria then in kingdom protista also you will have 
unicellular organisms. They are unicellular prokaryotes here, whereas protista are uh, unicellular eukaryotic organisms. So these both groups will be comprising of unicellular organisms, that is the body just made up of a single cell and therefore they would be microscopic structures. We won't be able to see them through our naked eyes. Then you have, you can also have unicellular organisms even in, in the kingdom fungi like yeast and even in the kingdom plantae like some algae like uh, Chlamydomonas, Chlorella, Acetabularia, these are some uh, plants that are unicellular and talking about multicellular organisms where all you will find multicellular organisms multicellular organisms are mostly fungi plantae and animalia with few exceptions of some being unicellular I have already told you about it so let us see their pictures let us see them uh, some of the examples of unicellular organisms here you have bacteria under which kingdom they are going to come under? They come under Monera. Okay, so then they are bacteria, unicellular organisms. Then you have amoeba and paramecium coming under protista. Amoeba, paramecium coming under protista. So they are also unicellular. Next, as I told you, in kingdom plant, they also you may have some unicellular organisms. Others being multicellular. A few unicellular organisms in plants kingdom are, these are some of the green algae, Chlamydomonas. Acetabularia chlorella. Now Acetabularia even though some one of the important interesting fact about Acetabularia is even though it is unicellular uh, you can see it because it measures from 0.5 cm to 10 cm. So they are gigantic in spite of they being unicellular. Now so when we analyze the unicellular organisms Unicellular organisms are capable of independent existence and perform the essential functions of life. In spite of they being a single cell organism, their body comprising of only a single cell, they are able to have an independent existence. They can live independently and they can perform all the essential functions of life. So it tells us that anything less than a complete cell will not be having independent existence. And hence, the definition of cell is, uh, is clear that it is the fundamental structural and functional unit of all living organisms. Okay, moving on to multicellular organisms. What are multicellular organisms? Organisms that have, that are comprising of many cells. They have many cells. Now, some examples here are, you can see some fungi. Now here you have to use a microscope to see them more clearly. This is penicillium. Now that can be seen very uh, using your naked eye. You can clearly see fungi. So fungi are multicellular group of organisms. Then as I told you, plants. Plants are also multicellular. Then comes animals, multicellular. In multicellular organisms, they show a higher level of organization okay since uh, as the body size of the organism increase the, the, the cell size doesn't increase instead what happens is the number of cells increase so that is why we call them call those organisms the multicellular so most of the time uh, the multicellular organisms are big organisms and we do not require any microscope to view them because they are made up of many number of cells now, and they show a higher level of organization, body organization as compared to unicellular. Here you will find that the cells, so they, since they will be having many cells, remember these cells all will not be doing the same function. They can do all the same function but here the cells get specialized. In multicellular organisms, cell differentiation begins to take place. As a result, there will be division of labor. That is, each cell will be doing a specific function. This was not happening in the case of unicellular organisms. In the case of unicellular organisms, all the functions, whether digestion, excretion, absorption, or respiration, all these functions were, were done by the same cell. But in the case of multicellular organisms, okay, especially plants and animals, they show a bit higher level of uh, or body organization that is they begin to show cell differentiation that is in spite of these cells being in the same body they will be of different kinds 
doing specific functions. So you'll find there is division of labor in case of multicellular organisms. And this is how they are organized. The cells are the building blocks of them too. The cells organize, they will collect together and form uh, tissues. Group of tissues forms organ. Organs together form the organ system and find the an organism. So in multicellular organism, what will you find is the cells, since there are so many different cells in the body, these cells will be uh, doing different functions, that is they will be showing cellular differentiation and uh, they have a higher level of organization as compared to the unicellular organisms. Hope that is clear about unicellular and multicellular organisms. Now, talking about the discovery of cell. Let's quickly uh, talk about the discovery of cell. Now, I hope you, you are very familiar with this person. Who is he? Robert Hooke. So, Robert Hooke in the year 1665 discovered cell while observing thin slices of cork. Now, what is this cork? Cork is actually uh, the, uh, it, it's, it's a dead tissue which is present in the bark of the wooden trees. And these are basically commercially used for making uh, stoppers for bottles, especially for wine bottles. So these wine bottles, they are uh, closed using this cork. So uh, uh, Robert Hooke, using a uh, uh, microscope, took thin sections of this cork, okay, actually a plant cell, uh, took thin sections of the cork and observed a honeycomb-like structure under the microscope. You can see honeycomb like structures. Now you can see. So he observed, he observed under the microscope small compartments. Okay, and which he said is somewhat similar to the places where uh, monks uh, live or somewhat similar to the places where uh, prisoners live. And, and he gave the term to these small compartments as cell, okay, which has been derived from the Latin term cella, which means small rooms. Now, he published his findings, Robert Hooke published his findings in the book Micrographia. So, Robert Hooke was a person who discovered a dead cell. He was the one to discover a cell, but he discovered not a living cell, but he discovered dead cell. So he, he had actually seen, uh, the compartments that he had seen was nothing but the plant cell walls having enclosing uh, empty spaces because those were dead cells. Now, the living cell, the discovery of living cell is credited to Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Now, Anton von Leeuwenhoek is also called as a father of microbiology. Okay, so he was one who discovered, as I told you, living cells. He examined single cell organisms like bacteria, protozoa, uh, in, in the pond water. He also observed sperms, erythrocytes, etc. under his microscope. So now let us talk about cell theory. Now what is a theory? Theory is a group of linked ideas intended to explain something based on facts that have been repeatedly confirmed through observation and experiment. So theory is a group of ideas that has been confirmed over time repeatedly through experiments and observations. So over the years with the advancement in the field of microscopy and with many scientists exploring more about cells and uh, coming to the same conclusion, there were two scientists, Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann, okay, who proposed the cell theory. Now, in 1838, Matthias Schleiden, a German botanist, examined a large number of plants and observed that all plants are composed of different kinds of cells which form the tissues of the plant. So he being a German botanist, he started exploring, he started uh, to study about different plants and he found all the plants were having or were made up of cells. At about the same time, Theodor Schwann, uh, an English zoologist in the year 1839, he also observed plants and animals and he concluded the following. What did he conclude? He said animal cells have a thin outer layer which is today known as a plasma membrane and in plant cells they have 
cell wall, which is a unique feature or capture of plant cells. And finally, he also added that the bodies of animals and plants are composed of cells and products of cells. So repeatedly over the time, through experimentation and observation, they found that the bodies of plants and animals were made up of cells. So they came up with cell theory, which they formulated the cell theory, which states that the bodies of all living beings are formed of cells and their products. And these cells are actually the structural and functional unit of all living organisms. But there was one uh, problem with this theory. This theory was unable to explain as to how new cells were formed. And this was rectified by another person whose name is Rudolf Verko. In the 1855, in the year 1855, he said, or uh, he explained that cells divide. He said that the cells divide and new cells are formed from pre-existing cells. So through divisions, cell give rise to a new cells. So, and the Latin phrase for that is omnis cellula e cellula, which means the cells are derived from the pre-existing cells. That is, the mother cell will divide into two daughter cells. So this is how uh, the, the cells arise. So he modified the hypothesis of Schleiden and Schwann to give the cell theory a final shape. Okay, so today the cell theory is understood in the following points. All living organisms are composed of cells and products of cells. All cells arise from pre-existing cells through cell division. Okay, so initially the uh, cell theory was proposed by Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann. Okay, but they could not explain how the cells, how new new cells arise. That was given or explained by Rudolf Verko. So the final uh, cell theory is given like this or comes like this. Okay, of course there are certain objections or exceptions to cell theory. Okay, so I am just talking about one exception or one objection to the cell theory and that is viruses. Viruses are not made up of cells. First and foremost, viruses do not fulfill this uh, thing what is, uh, uh, what is there in the cell theory because they are not made up of cells and they do not obey the theory of cell lineage or omnis cellular e cellular. So that's all for today. So this is what I have taught you today. What are the things I taught you today? Just only simple things we had just wrote or what you know. So what are the things we have learned? First of all, we defined what is a cell. Secondly, we spoke about what are unicellular and multicellular organisms. Okay, and then uh, we learned about the discovery of cell and finally we spoke about cell theory. Okay, so thank you.